Uh, we are really honored to be here in the library um, doing these tea talks. This is, I can't believe we're halfway there. This is number three. Today's program actually is the key that really the whole idea for this, for this series came about. And it's from incidents that happened last year around um, Charlottesville and in New Orleans um, in the removal of uh, some Confederate mo um, monuments and that whole dialogue the country had. So today we're gonna be looking at how we remember what are places and sources of memory. And um, one of the things that we had a kind of a little hard time with is when we um, used the image that we have, the, when we repeated that mythology about the memorial, Confederate memorial in York, Maine. So um, I have to make sure that I correct that statement. Um, there was an article, when I did my research, I didn't see the article from um, Deb McDermott talking about the monument, and I do have a copy of the article, and we sent it out. So I'm going to leave the other experts on our panel to talk a little bit more of that. And so with us today, we have um, Senator David Waters. His bio is in the book. Joel Christine Gill. And, and Eric Aldridge, who will, who will all be talking about different sites of cultural memory. And I'll just pass it right on over to them to start the program. Well, thank you, Jerry Ann, and good to see everybody. And I guess I have about, each of us have about 10 or 15 minutes to lay some things out. And then it's like, we light the fuse, and then we step back, and you're going to say whatever you want to say anyways, despite what we said, or maybe what we should have said. Um, so I did want to start with the Civil War and its commemoration, and what I would call a kind of problem of Civil War monuments. It's become quite direct to us with the removal of Confederate monuments, but I want to talk about the larger issue of why the memorialization of the um, Civil War had the effect of erasing black, black history from that struggle. Some of you may, may have seen uh, Coates' new book, um, We Were Eight Years in Power, and uh, in this book he has an interesting meditation on his sense of disaffection from the Civil War narrative. Um, and uh, he writes, our general sense of the war was that a horrible tragedy somehow had the magical effect of getting us free. Its legacy belonged not to us, but to those who reveled, reveled in the costume and technology of a time when we were property. Our alienation was neither achieved in independence nor stumbled upon by accident, but produced by American design. The belief that the Civil War wasn't for us was the result of the country's long search for a narrative that can reconcile white people with each other. And he speaks about how in the great period of monument production, both North and South, starting in the 1890s and really um, peaking in the years uh, towards the 50th anniversary of the Battle of, of Gettysburg, that there was a conscious effort, essentially, of an erasure of black history in the Civil War experience. And I would say both North and South. And that what we really see 50 years after Gettysburg, and remember, that's about as long after Gettysburg um, as we are now from Vietnam, and certainly these are times of reconstructions of the memory of, of that war. Um, but really in that period, we also see the modern construction of whiteness and America as a white nation, um, excluding from its national narrative people of color, immigrants, uh, and so forth. Um, there's a wonderful book by David Blight called Race in Reunion. It looks quite particularly at, at how the notion of bringing together the North and the South in a shared vision of imperialism and industrialization, that that required that there be a kind of a grand bargain over whiteness and Anglo Anglo-Saxonism and a kind of a erasure of the um, representation of, of slavery. And, and I would say that, you know, in light of the removal of Confederate flag or monuments, um, and then the question of the York monument, and I had heard that mythology, and I probably repeated it on occasion. And um, it occurs to me, though, that really there's a larger truth underneath that kind of mythology because of what did happen in York and in Kittery in the early years of the 20th century. That was one of those sites where people who summered up here from the south 
um, we had Thomas Nixon who wrote The Klansman, became Birth of a Nation, or The Leopard Spots, or Thomas Nelson Page who summered there with Harvard professors and, and other elites from Northeastern in institutions who were quite, quite concerned about immigration and about race and the loss of Anglo-Saxonism. And Thomas Nelson Page um, wrote a famous essay in which he said, you know, we really have to come together to defend whiteness and Anglo-Saxonism, whether it's against Japanese and Chinese in, in uh, California or against immigrants in, in New England or against the black man in the South, that we need a grand, grand bargain uh, for, for that endeavor. And, and from that group in Kittery and York came much of the ideology of colonial revival and uh, the whitening of history. And so the placement of monuments at that time, I think almost the, the Confederate monuments and the Northern Union monuments might really be a difference without a distinction. That both participated in a whitening of the memory of what the Civil War, Civil War meant. Um, if you're interested in this story, Donna Cassidy has a really interesting uh, a chapter in, in her book on the Kona Revival, which talks about uh, York and, and, and Kittery in this context. Um, you know, and so I want to talk a little bit about, uh, about memory itself and, and you know, so the, what, what we should really think then about, about memory and uh, how these national myths and narratives of, of, of memory and race get, get created. Uh, and again, you know, history is in America is a funny thing. Um, you know, it, it, it is, the past isn't, isn't really past, as, as Faulkner said. Um, I know a man whose grandfather was in the War of 1812. Hmm? And how many of us here remember seeing Civil War veterans in the 1950s, the last few? All right, I certainly do in, in Connecticut, one of the last veterans riding in a, in a parade when I was a Cub Scout marching with the flag in the early 19, 1950s. Um, so this, uh, the, the, these memories are there, but what, what happens um, what happens to him, and I, and I think it has something to do perhaps with the nature of memory. I brought along a, a memory jug. Um, these were created oftentimes be put on, on graves of the deceased. Um, it's a jug, a, a, often a whiskey jug, um, but then it is covered with plaster, and then items that might be related to the deceased or to uh, religious expression, particularly iron for Ogun, and then the mirrors for the flash of the of the spirit, um, and then white objects, white buttons, uh, things made out of shells, um, referencing West African uh, tradition. But the idea of these is that memory is performative, that it isn't monumentalized. There isn't a hegemony of, of memory, that memory is something the African American community uh, creates as community. And if you think of the um, art of Carrie James Washington or Kara Walker, it's very particularly that way of, of trying to undermine the kind of official narrative of, of memory so that memory is created by the experience of the community uh, of the present as it understands the past. And, and I think if you, you know, the African Burying Ground Monument here, part of, the, part of the genius in that design is that there's no central narrative to it. There's no authority. You take a journey into memory from the past to the present. It is kind of distemporal. It takes you out of time. Um, and so it's not centered in one interpretation of it. You have to create the experience of that monument for yourself, unlike the Civil War statues where you're kind of told to revere, they're elevated on platforms, they're frozen um, in, in time. Uh, so I think that the, that kind of notion of journey, contingencies of memory, um, rather than being marmorial, marble, granite, bronze, the kind of frozen pageant of white commemoration of the Civil War, now, I wanted to take my last few minutes by taking us back to the moment at which this kind of bargain was made. And I've handed out copies of a poem by Robert Frost, um, which I will just point to a couple of passages in. Frost um, was in Derry, New Hampshire, and participated in a lot of Memorial Day activities. Uh, he lived, his farmhouse was next to the farmhouse of Mrs. Upton, whose husband had been the first to die from Derry in the Civil War, and after whom the Grand Army of the Republic Post uh, was, was named. And starting around 1906, 1907, and culminating when he published this poem in 1914, he contemplated a lot what the legacy of the Civil War was, was going to be. Now, for him, it was personal. He was named Robert Lee Frost after Robert E. Lee by his Copperhead Southern Sympathizing 
father. Um, and after he published this poem, he never used the name Lee in public. Again, uh, up to that point, he'd always signed his poetry Robert Lee Frost, and it became Robert Frost. And if you look at the poem, you see that he's kind of trying to contemplate how is it that you know, the, the, that this legacy of the Civil War, and as he talks about Jefferson's ideal, is being fled by white people at this time in order to preserve their whiteness. Now, Frost, in talking about the black cottage, is referencing the way mold turns an old cottage black. It's because of what is called melanism, this process of transferring. Frost knew the word melanism. He thought of titling his most famous book, North of Boston, Melanism about blackening. It's a blackening of crops. It's also a blackening of chicken. He raised chickens. But I think in the poem you'll see also the danger for a white person of entering the black cottage is that you get blackened by it. And you'll see in the poem there's a kind of a retreat from this black cottage, which is a kind of a, uh, an insistent memory of what the Civil War was about. I'll just read a couple of parts uh, from it. And I, I want to see, you know, just to, to you to notice how careful he's talking about representation, about this, this kind of telescoping sequence of images that distance him from the past of the Civil War, and how this good minister who was his companion, perhaps like one of the good white ministers that King addresses in his letter from a Montgomery jail, is willing to participate in this kind of evisceration of memory and is the aestheticizing of it. So just I will read a few lines from it. We chanced in passing by that afternoon to catch it in a sort of special picture among tar-banded ancient cherry trees set well back from the road in rank lodged grass, the little cottage we were speaking of, a front with just a door between two windows, fresh painted by the shower of velvet black. We paused, the minister and I, to look. He made as if to hold it at arm's length or put the leaves aside that framed it. Pretty, he said. Come in, no one will care. The path was a, path was a vague parting in the grass that led us to a weathered windowsill. We pressed our faces to the pane. You see, he said, everything's as she left it when she died. Her sons wouldn't sell the house or the things in it. They say they mean to come in summer here where there are boys. They haven't come this year. They live so far away. One is out west. It will be hard for them to keep their word. Anyway, they won't have the place disturbed. A buttoned hair cloth lounge spread scrolling arms under a crayon portrait on the wall, done sadly from an old daguerreotype. That was the father as he went to war. She always, when she talked about war, sooner or later came and leaned, half dealt against the lounge beside it, though I doubt if some un such unlifelike lines kept power to stir anything in her after all the years he fell at Gettysburg or Fredericksburg. I ought to know. It makes a difference which Fredericksburg wasn't Gettysburg, of course. But what I'm getting at is how forsaken a little cottage this has always seemed. So, you see, here's the, that, that kind of tar. It's the, this cottage is the kind of tar baby. If you get too close, you touch something potent in that memory of what it meant, even though if you can't remember if it's Gettysburg or Fredericksburg. And that she had insisted, the top of the next line, that's a hard mystery of Jefferson's. What did he mean? Of course, the easy way to decide it wasn't true, that all men are uh, created equal. But she felt that her husband had to have died for something, for something that had to do about the equality of the races. Well, they turn away and decide to leave the cottage and the memory of the Civil War and the memory of equal rights to rot. But the last gesture is the minister knocks on the side of the house and bees put their angry heads out, like violence, prophecy of violence lingering there, kind of unspoken, and they look at a blazing kind of apocalyptic sunset as they depart. So that's the bargain. I think in these monuments, that they really are a monument to forgetting, not to remembering. Good. I grew up in um, this little town called Rocky Mount, Virginia, in um, southwestern Virginia. It's about two hours from Greensboro. If you ever heard of the Martinsville Speedway for racing? 
Um, it's a little bit there. And, um, you know, I spent most of my time in this little housing complex called Candlewood. And, you know, when you're, when you're in the early 80s and you're a little kid, you get a bike and you just ride all over the place. And you spend most of your time driving over, riding bikes everywhere, you know, driving bikes over um, in the neighborhood next door or across town or to the dam or wherever you can and sitting in people's cherry trees and eating their cherries because little kids don't really understand property value or property tax or property boy borders. Um, and um, in 1983, I think I was probably about eight or nine years old, there was a Klan march in my town that walked right down the center of Main Street past the statue of Jubal Early. Um, anybody know who Jubal Early was? Jubal Early was a um, Confederate lieutenant, I think. And he created this thing right after the Civil War. It's funny, you bring up um, Coates, and most people read the, the title of Coates' book, um, We Were Eight Years in Power, and think, oh, he must be talking about Obama, but he's not. He's talking about the period from 1865 to 1877 when um, black people actually had some agency over their lives. And that agency um, made its, manifested itself as black towns, you know, black equality, black politicians, black people in power. Um, and there's this thing called the Warmly Accords that happens in Washington, D.C. at this man named Warmly's house. And Warmly says, um, he's, a, he's a black business owner, but he's not even involved with this. It's just called the Warmly Accords because it happens at his house, and he's two, and there was a contested election in 1877 between Samuel Tilden and Rutherford B. Hayes, um, and it was over 20 electoral college votes, including Florida, because damn it, it's always Florida, right? <laughs> um, and so... Copperhead Democrats had started to come back into power at this point. Most people don't understand that. The, most people sort of equate, you know, you know, in politically sort of um, convenient ways that Democrats were the were the slaveholders and the Southerners and, and the, the creators of Jim Crow, which is which is right, but it's a little more complicated than that. Um, and so these um, Copperhead Democrats who own those Confederate, um, who own those, um, who controlled those. Um, Electoral College votes decided to trade away those votes to Rutherford B. Hayes for an end of Reconstruction. And so that ended the eight years that we were in power. Um, and it was after this time that we start getting Jim Crow laws and vagrancy laws um, and a number of other things. And you get Confederate Democrats who were like, I don't, I'm not, like, I'm not a fan of slavery. I would never bring slavery back. That's not something I'd be interested in. Um, the war was not necessarily about slavery wasn't about slavery. Um, and it wasn't about slavery for the Union. It wasn't about slavery for Lincoln. It was about keeping the Union together. But for the South, it was absolutely about slavery. Um, when you look at Mississippi, which was the first state um, to, which was one of the richest state in the Union before slavery and the poorest state afterwards, you can understand why they were fighting. They were fighting for their rights. Um, and South Carolina was another one. South Carolina actually had all black towns um, and black you know, black power centers. So um, the reason I tell you about the, the Klan march and going by Jubal Early, because Jubal Early had this idea. It's called the Lost Cause. Anybody ever heard of the Lost Cause? Most people don't know this. The Lost Cause was this movement among Confederate Democrats to make um, the Civil War about something other than slavery. It was a concerted effort. Um, they wrote books about it. They wrote essays about it. They basically um, proliferated the knowledge in the South that the Civil War was about taxes and tariffs, which were handled in 1845, but it was about taxes and tariffs. It was about states' rights, where in reality, it, you know, it couldn't have been about states' rights because in 1857, they passed the Fugitive Slave Act, and one of the reasons that the Southern Confederacy um, seceded is because the Union was, the federal government was not requiring Northern states to return federal property. So it was actually against, the, it was against states' rights. Um, so what they started to do was to change everything, change the idea from anything but slavery. And some of these things were this, this, this reclaiming of, uh, of, the, of the South as this noble sort of enterprise, and we were, that we were only destroyed because of the brutish nature of the, conf of the North and their overpowering and brutish ideas. We were genteel, and our slaves were happy. Um, they were happy, and if you, and we have proof it's called Gone with the Wind. We're going to go get those. We're going to make sure those Yankees can't do anything to you, Miss Scarlett. 
um, which is just a jarring sort of thing to watch if you are a black person watching that movie. Um, but that, that book and The Klansman, which became, um, which became Birth of the Nation, were sort of the ending sort of like periods of what happens at the end of Reconstruction. What, the, what, was, the, what was Reconstruction? It was the fulfillment of the lost cause. Most people don't know that, that on the books right now in Washington, there is a law to create a Mammy statue on, this, on the Mall of Washington, on the Washington Mall. And Mammy was this idea because one of these, one of these Southern politicians read Gone with the Wind and was like, we need to write, we need to build a statue to this black woman who loved her family and took care of her slaves and took care of her people and took care of the master's children, not realizing that Mammy is a character that never really existed. Um, she was not even, most, most women that took care of children um, weren't women, they were 12 year old girls or younger and they would be beaten if the kids soiled themselves or they didn't, if they weren't potty trained. So people had this really, they had composed this idea of what the South looked like and this is when we also get monuments these monuments to these Southern generals. Because right after the Civil War, most people forget that it was illegal to, sh to, to display the Confederate flag. It was illegal to put that outside. It was illegal to put those things out there in the world. Um, and so there wasn't anything after that, but until when Copperhead de Democrats, um, and I say Copperhead Democrats as opposed to Democrats because there, was, there were definitely Democrats in the South that were not um, Copperhead Democrats. That, that's why you have in the South, you've got um, Southern Baptist and Union Baptist. Most people don't realize that those were the, the church split because there was a separation between the Southern, the Baptists, where some of them were supporting the Union, some were supporting the, the, the Confederacy. Um, but those ideas about why we, why that, so that's ingrained in our history now, right? So it's like it becomes, it, you become, um, you seem balanced when you say, well, the Civil War was about a little bit more than what people were talking about when you don't really just confront it. And it's usually people reading the documents that have, of the lost cause. They're reading the ideas of the lost, lost cause, which are embedded in what we are talking about right now. All that idea is about, and so, um, so this is why this is where it becomes complicated, right? Because you've got a generation or a couple of generations of people who have been reading these ideas about the lost cause and taking them as fact, and so you have some people like, for example, my son's godfather who carries a Confederate flag in his pocket. He's, he doesn't think he's racist. He thinks he's celebrating heritage. He doesn't. Re he's read the ideas of the lost cause that have been embedded in history books over the last over the course of the last hundred years or so, and he's sort of taken to his idea that you know the Civil War wasn't about slavery. My wife and I went to our took our children to um, my daughter's on a trip from um, across country. We and we mostly spent it in the Southwest in the South, and we went to the first the first White House of the Confederacy. And so we go in and they have, it's a really amazing place. If you ever get a chance, it's right down the, it's actually like within walking distance of um, the, um, the Dexter Parsonage where Dr. King was um, the minister during the Montgomery bus boycotts. Um, and you can walk between those two, just don't go in August because if you walk between those two in August, you will melt. Um, but so we go into the first White House of the Confederacy and there's a guy in Confederate garb and he's giving us a tour and he's very, the docent's very nice. Um, my wife told me I could not ask questions. Um, and so he goes through this whole process of explaining the Civil War and, and the ideas, and then I start hearing lost cause. The lo I start hearing the lost cause. It starts to creep into what he's talking about. And he goes, you know, the, the Confederate Constitution um, doesn't say anything about slavery, and I go to put my hand up, my wife puts it down. Um, because if you read the Constitution of the Confederacy, it does, probably two or three things that the United States, the, the, our Constitution doesn't do. It's actually a stronger document in a lot of ways. It actually clarifies a lot of things within um, states' rights. It clarifies some, some specific powers that are dealt, dealt to the federal government versus the state. But then it makes, makes two, I think, significant changes. And if you've ever read it, these are the changes that I think it makes. One of them is that it gets the president one six-year term, which I think is probably a good idea. Um, and the other thing is that it makes slavery legal. It implicitly says slavery is legal. Um, and that guy, that docent, is completely affected by this guy whose monument I walked past every day when I was a kid, Jubal Early, about this idea that, and that monument, again, guess when it was built? Between 1877 and 1920, um, during the Lost Cause. 
So it's a, the lost cause has effectively permeated every part of our understanding about the history of, of what happened in the South. Um, you know, even in the language that we use when we talk about um, black people leaving the South in the 1920s, we call it the Great Migration. Any other group of people, we would call them refugees because they're leaving the South because of black terrorism. I mean, white terrorism. They're not staying there because, I mean, it was, it was a concerted effort. Um, the you know, laws that are created, the way in which we create criminals were specifically designed to attack slaves. You know, vagrancy laws, not having a job is because we want to put you back in the chain gang and put you back to work. If you don't have a job, then you're shiftless. People didn't understand that people start to leave, start to leave the South. Immediately, the roads are packed with slaves because people are going out to find their family and their lost loved ones that you can see in newspapers up until the 1920s and 30s. People are still looking for their lost loved ones. Because the lost cause has permeated into everything that we talk about when we talk about history, if you ever hear somebody say the Confederate, the uh, the Civil War was not about slavery, have them read secession documents. The first line in almost every single secession document is that we are beholden to the institution of slavery. Every single document. I got into a flame war on Facebook. Anybody know what those are? Flame wars when you're like on Facebook and you start, I know it doesn't happen all the time. I know it's like Facebook is a really like rational conversation sort of a place. Um, <laughs> But um, I, got on, I, got to this, you know, I got into this flame war on Facebook with this guy, I, this guy who I called him, a, in my mind I had, he's lost cause mentality. He's got that, he's got that, that idea and all of that stuff that's been written about the lost cause embedded in what he's thinking. Um, and he goes, we're going back and forth. And I, you know, I, as a historian, I mean, I'm a cartoonist, but I'm also a historian. I usually just like respond to those things with actual documents. I don't like, it's not what you know, some you know, Harvard professor wrote in 1970 about the Civil War. I, I give you what those actual people wrote at the time because primary documents trump Harvard professors in the 70s every single day of the week. Um, so I send them the documents. He says it wasn't about, he said it was about taxes and tariff. I send him like the law that changes taxes and tariff in 1845. He said, well, it was about states' rights. And then I send him the arguments that this, the, the South were making about um, the federal government um, returning their property, forcing the states to do something. He says, well, it's not about the war. And he goes, and I send him some information. And this guy gets really smart. He was a brilliant loss causer. Um, <laughs> he sends me something that, that Lincoln said about it not being about slavery. And so I like, I'm like, okay. I start to type and I'm like, oh, he almost got me. He almost got me, because I almost started to argue that it was about slavery, but I realized what he was doing was like, he was telling me the people who did not own slaves didn't really care about the slavery, but the people who did, did. The people who were, he was like entrenched in this idea um, about the lost cause. Um, and it's, it's complicated now, right? Because we're dealing with people who have, um, you know, in Charlottesville and a number of other places across the country who are, you know, some people, not all of them, but there are some people that are, in, like, that are entrenched with the idea that the, the Confederacy and the Confederate flag is, a, is heritage because they're, they're basically indoctrinated into the idea of the lost cause. And then there are some people who know that that's, BS, so like for lack of a better word, they know this BS. They just want their white supremacy, white supremacy symbols up there, including the Confederate flag. If you ever get into an idea about someone with the Confederate flag, just ask them what the guy who wrote, who created the Confederate flag said, because um, he basically says that it is a flag to show that white people are the dominant race on the, on, on the planet. His exact words: I, people, "We need this flag for this." Um, so. Just in, um, when you're having these arguments, if you find yourself on Facebook, um, you know, just keep in mind that some people have been indoctrinated by the lost cause, and it's going to take a lot. Of, it's going to take a lot to to sort of pull them back out of that trench. Hi there. Can you folks hear me? Okay. Uh, I just want to say a quick th thanks to uh, Black Heritage Trail of New Hampshire for uh, setting this up and for the other T's. Uh, I think it's great that uh, you are a statewide organization now, so congratulations for that. That's a terrific way to uh, have an organization really as a memorial to keep these stories alive and to keep uh, this, you know, this heritage alive. And 
and to help set things into context. Oh, yeah, thank you. And, and just a uh, note, I saw um, earlier this week, uh, or last week, sorry, um, Shadows Fall North, terrific film. If you haven't seen it, it's, it's really good. Jerry Ann came to my hometown of, of Hancock uh, last week to show that. And we had a full house and uh, a terrific reception. So, um, so you know, my, my bit in this is quite different from, from the, the previous panelists here. Um, my, uh, my own introduction to black history in New Hampshire uh, came about from my habit of, of being in the woods. It really came in the forest where there are few monuments uh, and, and few markers. And there are, uh, in my neck of the woods, in southwestern New Hampshire, a small town called Hancock. Uh, it's just north of Monadnock a bit. There are uh, plenty of cellar holes. And uh, do you know what the cellar holes are? They're old foundations. So, uh, and, and sort of honing in closer to where I am, uh, in the southwestern part of Hancock, uh, I have the, I have the um, privilege of being next to quite a bit of protected land, uh, somewhere in the order of 10 to 15,000 acres of protected lands, uh, protected by various conservation organizations. And so um, I've lived there forever and have uh, always wandered those hills. And uh, sometimes because I hunt, and sometimes just because I like to explore, and I'm often off the trails, just in the woods. And so um, as I did that, I would come across cellar holes, and my curiosity would be piqued. And I needed to know who lived where and when, and who these people were, exactly who, what the families were, what they were like, what they did. And um, so that would lead me to the usual sources, the town histories, you know, old maps, um, archives, census figures, and things like that. And um, I, would, I would, you know, have maps and I would spreadsheets, everything. I was pretty geeky about it. Um, and as I did this, you know, I, I had a lot of families that I sort of kept track of in the past. But there were, there were five or six cellar holes in particular that I kept coming back to and uh, that kept intriguing me. And as I looked at the census figures, it said that the people who lived here were uh, of mixed race, uh, according to the census. They, they were free people of color. And these five hole cellar holes were all linked by one family, the Dew family, D-U-E. And um, so I had to find out their story, figure out who they were. And um, they, they were uh, associated with another fellow named Jack Ware who, uh, as the story goes, was captured as a boy in Africa and brought over here as a slave and was enslaved for I don't know how long, a period in his life, somehow gained his freedom and ended up in the hills of the outskirts of Hancock and uh, in the se late 1770s with this family, uh, the Dew family. They were very closely associated, I could tell that. So the Dews uh, lived in Hancock for th three or four generations, from the late 1770s to um, 1860s, I think. And as I, as I went through the stories, it kind of led me to um, church archives. This is just, uh, you know, just a little bit of it. It's, it's, you know, I don't know if you've seen archives in, in libraries and so on, but they're just, it's an old book, and it's the, it's the written account of the of the history of the church, basically, by the pastors at the time. So I, I got into that, and I uh, unearthed um, the stories that aren't in our town histories. There's no monuments, there's no markers, there's no, there's no mention of them in the town, and it's largely um, erased and forgotten, as I'm sure people wanted to, to be forgotten. Uh, but it was the story of uh, uh, some very hard times in, endured by this Dew family. And I, I don't have time to tell the whole story, but I can tell you that uh, there were several episodes uh, 
involving the church, the Hancock Congregational Church, and the pastors who led the church, Reverend Reed Page and Reverend Archibald Burgess. And um, between the 1790s and 1830s, this involved several episodes uh, where the, uh, this family, various family members were charged with things like adultery, uh, defying the church, um, not reflecting penitence. Uh, and ultimately, several of these members of the Dew family were excommunicated and cast aside from the church. And these were usually in very public uh, and very humiliating uh, ways. These were, you know, church hearings that are pretty much like town meetings today, as you might imagine. So, um, and there was one woman in particular, uh, Betsy Du Raisi, who uh, strongly defied the church and stood up for herself and stood up against, you know, the all-powerful church in town and the Reverend Archibald Burgess. And uh, she had refused to take back her adulterous husband was the charge leveled against her. But, but the real charge was standing up against the church and uh, defying Pat, uh, Reverend Burgess. And she was ultimately excommunicated. But in the process that led up to that, it was two and a half years of public and very uh, emotionally wrenching hearings where she stood up against the church. It was awful. It was messy and it was public. So um, life eventually went on for, for Betsy Du Raisi and the rest of her family. And she lost, you know, in the process of this, the Du family lost uh, what modest wealth they had. And, uh, and, and life, like I said, went on. That family eventually, um, I don't know how to say it, uh, but they basically became white, you know, and uh, ultimately lost track of their black heritage until uh, one member who, um, in the 1980s, as this woman retired, she had been a Mormon, and she went and found her family history, went to Hancock, and discovered her, her, black, uh, her black heritage, so, or her mixed race. So I don't know anything beyond that. But um, anyway, life went on for them, and life went on too for Archibald Burgess, the pastor in the, in the church, who um, ultimately became vigorously opposed to the anti-slavery movement that was coming uh, spreading across you know, New Hampshire and New England. And um, uh, you know, he, was, he was among several pastors around New Hampshire, I'm sure you know about this, David, that, uh, that really opposed the anti-slavery movement. And there were some who, who favored uh, abolition, but Reverend Archibald Burgess was not one of them. And he was reviled by the by the anti-slavery press to the point where, um, you know, this is like in the 1840s, they, he was described as being uh, the, the fat pig, Reverend Archibald Burgess, and, and other kind of disparaging ways of, of, to describe him. So in, in 1841, um, as the anti-slavery movement kept sort of spreading across New Hampshire and other parts, there would be anti-slavery conventions. And, the Reverend Henry C. Wright uh, would come to speak in Hancock, and he was, uh, he was a fairly well-known uh, abolitionist. And he, um, before he came, Reverend Burgess stood up in front of the church and uh, ad warned his, his parishioners not to attend Reverend Wright's talk, his sermon. And if they did, they would be cast out of the church. And so, of course, Several members of the congregation did attend and were fairly vocal about that. And uh, they were excommunicated from the church, kicked out, and uh, in a very public and emotionally wrenching way, too. But they stood up against him. And, um, and then the next year, 1842, there was another anti-slavery convention in Hancock with kind of an all-star cast of characters. Uh, Nathaniel Rogers, who was uh, editor of the Herald of Freedom newspaper here in New Hampshire in Concord, Parker Pillsbury, and Stephen uh, Foster, and the Hutchinson family singers. They all came to Hancock. They came to other towns but, uh, and, did, and did these, these conventions too. But when they came to Hancock, Reverend Burgess did the same thing. You will not, you will not attend this, and if you do, there will be consequences. 
And uh, he uh, encouraged the youth of the church to show up and um, give them a hard time, give the anti-slavery folks a hard time, and they did. And it was basically an angry mob. They threw rocks at the church right through the windows. They roughed up the speakers. They interrupted the speakers. They went right up to the speakers and stood behind them and, and argued with them right in front of everybody. Um, so it was, it was pretty ugly. Um, and, and similar scenes happened throughout New Hampshire and other parts of New England. But what, what happened in Hancock was not unusual in the ways that people of color were mistreated and, um, and, and things were forgotten. And, and you know, as, as, we were, as I said earlier, there's nothing in the town history to refer to these, these two tracks, either the Dew story or the anti-slavery conventions, really nothing. Um, there's no, nothing at the cemetery except uh, the stones, the, the tombstones and headstones of Archibald Burgess and, and um, the Dew family, what, what, what's left of them. And uh, the townspeople largely don't know about this. Um, and the few who do know about it, uh, are, some of them are still fairly uncomfortable with, um, with the topic. And uh, with me telling the story sometimes as I go, I do uh, sort of cellar hole walks where I will talk about it. And it's a touchy topic in Hancock even to this day. Uh, some people don't like it to be brought up. Hancock. Uh, it's like many other New Hampshire towns, but a, you know, it's like a Courier and Ives town. It's got lots of pretty white buildings all on Main Street, and it's very harmonious, and this topic does sort of upset that narrative. And, um, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's still a touchy thing. So, um, at any rate, um, I think about, you know, the, the theme of this talk, and I think about uh, an author who lives in town, uh, Howard Mansfield, and he wrote a book called In the Memory House, and it's about how we remember history and how what we choose to remember, what we choose to forget, and, um, and sometimes we build monuments to the things we want to remember and how we want to remember them. Um, but he also says um, something I thought sounded right, and he said some things disappear so well that ultimately they're completely forgotten. Uh, nothing is left, but uh, you know I think it's it's talks like this that, and and Black Heritage Trail of New Hampshire that helps us keep some of these memories alive. So thank you so much. Before I open up the discussion to the floor, did you want to show an image, no, Joel? No, it's fine. We'll, we'll just go ahead. Okay. I just want to, just in case they didn't know what it is you do and what you were talking about. Let's see a picture or two. Just, come on, yeah. come on, man. Come on. Don't be shy. <laughs> so when I'm thinking about this, um, I initially um, was going to show some images from a book, my, my book, um, Strange Fruit on Celebrated Narratives from Black History, um, Volume 2. Um, which just came out um, this um, month. And I was gonna talk about Victor Green and the Green Book. Um, is anybody familiar with the Green Book? Yeah. Yeah. So the Green Book was a book that was created by a man named Victor Green in New York for black people to travel. Um, so after, after the refugees um, left the South to go North, when, people, when cars started becoming affordable for everybody, they made these books. Um, they were trying to go back down south. And so now that you're no longer down south, where do you stop to get gas? You know, which, which town should you stay out of? And most people thought that those towns were only occurred when you hit the Mason-Dixon line. Um, but when I moved here from Boston in 2002, I discovered something really interesting. I don't know if you guys know this, but racism exists above the Mason-Dixon line too. Um, and um, so these towns, um, there will be sundown towns. Anybody know what a sundown town is? Um, so a sundown town was a town where black people weren't allowed in the town after sundown. And so Victor Green started compiling a list of these places that people could go, and he put it together in a book called The Green Book for the Negro Motorist. This is the story of the Green Book, and it um, starts with a family um, driving um, from New York to the south, and the son in the, back of the, in the back has to go to the bathroom. 
and they keep thinking about where they could stop and there's no place for them to stop as they go um, until finally they just stop in the woods um, and the little boy goes to the bathroom. Um, and it was a common experience for black people. This is, a, this is a portrait of Victor Green. So Victor Green put together, he compiled a list of all these places that black people could go. Um, and basically what he says in this very sort of like um, even-handed way to, to, to avoid embarrassment, um, because that was sort of a way in which he could talk about it as opposed to what would normally happen, which is um, these are some of the places that people couldn't go. Um, and then Victor Green's book made it safe for people to go in a number of different places. Um, and so, because not planning could, could be inconvenient where you run out of class. You can see where it says, no Negroes, no Mexicans. Um, and this one is just some people standing outside with a shotgun. And then this is a Klan rally. And the people are flying away. And so when he put together this book, he, he um, put together this, a number of different places for people to go. And also, um, he also um, incorporated um, all black, all places where you could go um, that were all black resorts. Um, this one's called Idlewild, um, which was in um, Michigan. And, um, and so you can see here, black people were banned from many public beaches, and if they would go to some beaches, it would still be a problem. And so when you went to Idlewild, that was no longer an issue. And um, I talk about this a little bit um, in the beginning of the book. Um, in the foreword, I talk about the idea that you know, black people are going to these places not to be exclusionary, but to actually go to a place where you can check race at the door. You know, like it, you know, it, there are people in, in this room that I'm sure you understand what it's like to be the diversity when you walk into a room. Um, and I think that, you know, because we wear our immigration on our skin, that means our, we wear our immigration directly out front. It doesn't mean that we're not, um, that we're not any less American. But we, because we wear our immigration on our skin, because you can see the fact that my family came from a different place, it becomes an issue in America. And it's, you know, it, it, relates, to the, it relates to the lost cause and to Bacon's Rebellion. I can talk about this for stuff for a couple hours, but Jerry Ann's going to kick me off in a minute. Um, <laughs> so um, this is just a book about the, this is the story of the Green Book. And this is, um, most of those places were sort of um, um, done away with after segregation. But... You know, there, there are those people who still lament the idea of these all black anything. And I think it's because, you know, we still live in a society where black people have to sort of have that conversation about race on a regular basis. Like, it's not my job to teach you about race sort of a thing, like, but we have to. Because um, if we don't do it, who's going to do it? And, um, and I think that having, you know, understanding what the Green Book was, which was a place to find, to find safety, but also to find places where you could be, um, you, could, you could exist outside of that. You know, like to not have to go. I have a friend who puts together these black comic book conventions all over the country. And um, people are like, why are you going to do that? It's very exclusionary. But you see a black mother walking in there looking for comics, and you understand that, that she's looking for, she doesn't have to ask, are there, sto are there stories in here that look like my kids? You know what I mean? Like, is there, is there stories that we can look up to? And I don't think people have a, have a clear understanding about how much that representation is important. Um, so that's just a little bit about the Green Book. And um, I, have, um, so I have a few copies of my, my first three books as well. So like I said, if you guys are interested, I have, I have some copies. And then I can take your name and send you an order form for Evelyn's. Thank you. Thank you so much. So we're, op we're opening up the floor for discussion. And if you don't know, we, have, um, we had in Kittery one house um, on the green book, the Rock Grass, in case you don't know. It's also um, part of the Black Heritage Trail. Hi, thank you so much. Um, on the theme of comics and uh, black history with the Black Panther movie coming out this weekend, um, could you talk about that as a potential place for social monuments or stories or how do we create, I don't know, how stories um, fit in in comics and... Um, so when you meet somebody for the first time, whenever you meet somebody, you know, you share your story, right? You talk about where you've been, who you know, where you went to school, what you like, what you don't like. And that's, that's sharing little bits and pieces of your humanity. And when you share those stories, you get a better understanding of what it's like to be that person. So you have empathy for them. 
Um, when I went to see the Black Panther, I started to tear up in there. Um, I'm sure a lot of black people did because like how many, how many opportunities do we get to see positive role models of black people on television or in movies or in media that aren't magical Negroes like Bagger Vance? Does everybody know what the magical Negro trope is? It's when you have this black person who has some like sassy wisdom or ethnic wisdom that they impart on the main character so that they can go off and save the world. Um, like our only existence is, to, is for that one individual. And um, I look at um, you know, representations like the Black Panther and any, you know, any, of the TV, any of the movies with black casts. I mean, one of the ways to think about it is look at what they do in Europe, in England specifically. They just put black people in television and it's not a thing. You know, it's not like a conversation. Like, you know, it's not like some social commentary. It's just like, oh, there's a black character over here and he's going to go out and fight d zombies or to solve the mystery or do whatever. It's not like a thing, but in the United States, because we're fighting this uphill battle, it is because we have, um, we have a real, black people, people of color, minority people, LGBT people have a, have a relationship with America. And relationships are built on balances. You know, you, you make positive deposits, you make ne negative deposits. And in 1877, you know, black people had about a $500 negative um, deposit. And after, civil, after um, the end of slavery, we get down to 250. But we're still negative. Um, and then after 1877, it goes back up to maybe about 300. So we're taking negative deposits. Then we get the birth of the nation and the lost cause and um, black foot. So you're taking all these things out. And then in the civil rights movement, we get another big chunk comes out. Right? So we're about $100, $100 negative right now. So we're still at about $100 negative. We're probably like maybe $50, but we still haven't even got to a place where we're equal yet. So we can't, until we start, you know, movies like The Black Panther, any movies with black, positive black roles for, male, um, for <clears throat> black males, women, you know, like to understand that those things make positive, de positive deposits into that relationship until we get back to equal. And, and once we get to equal, that's when we can say, well, that's when we can talk about fairness. Do you know what I mean? That's when we can say, oh, it's, it's not fair that you have all these black characters in there. Because we, we can't talk about that yet because we're still negative. We still have detriment. Can I just add something to that? What Joel has said so well is that this is why it's so important to make visible the history, as, as Eric has talked about, or what Jerry Ann did with the uh, monument <clears throat> um, in, uh, for, Har for Harriet um, Wilson, Wilson over, over in, uh, in Milford, or what's been done here in, in Portsmouth. But, you know, so I don't know how many, what do you think, about three or four centuries maybe will catch up? Uh, <laughs> But in the meantime, it, the other monuments have to be deconstructed. It just, and the narratives have to be deconstructed because the power there is, is so intense and it has been in place now for, you know, the Lost Cause narrative has, has it won. It's been revivified in the last few years. It's been in place for 150 years. And so that, that has to be contested. Yep. That, has, that has to be broken. It has to be broken apart. Um, if people are going to be able to look at in a the, kind the, these way. monuments and, and, and see them for what they are. And I think it's important in a kind way to do that because, like I said, there are people who, are, who really believe that. It's their heritage. And, like, you have to, like, talk to them and just, like, you know what, I understand, but you realize that this isn't real, you know? Like, this isn't a real thing, and you have to be, you know, it, it has to be kindness because, like, my son's godfather, like, I, what am I going to tell him? Like, you're a racist? <laughs> you know what I mean? Like doesn't work, you know, like it doesn't work and he hits a wall, so. I thought that when you won a war, you were supposed to control the narrative. How did the North cede the entire narrative to the South? Well, uh, you know, I, I think Joel, describe the, the politics of it. And I think there was a, a politics and, and a big money of that time, but I think it was also a, a, a cultural war. And um, I think that, you know, as, in, as troublesome as it may be, I think a lot of writers decided that, whether North or, or South, I mean, how many black characters are there in the novels of Henry James? Okay? Um, you know, Robert Frost, um, 
you know, the, it's been described uh, by Derek Walcott, the Nobel laureate, that the unforgivable sin of Robert Frost was never to say a word about the civil rights struggle of the 1950s when he was the most famous writer in America. Um, so I, I, I think that, you know, in my work and what I've suggested here is that we really have to burrow, burrow down uh, into these individuals and understand what was at stake for them in their whiteness. Hi, uh, thank you for coming. I'm feeling edified. Um, I, I was listening to BBC last night. I can't tell you what time it was because I just woke up and that's what I hit the button and I listened to BBC. Uh, and there was a program on, and it's one of their history shows, and it talked about how this monument thing is an American phenomenon. And they talked about the argument of, of having the two sides, having these monuments to the generals and all this. Yes, they got Lenin and they got Raleigh, but they don't have the preponderance in every little town. And they were talking about, and I fell back to sleep, so I'm gonna ask your opinion on this. They were talking about where, where, will it, where, where does it stop? What about Jefferson, who was a president? And then I fell asleep. So I'm wondering what you guys think about that. I would've probably fallen asleep too. Um, <laughs> Yeah, monument, I don't, you know, the monument thing is, you know, it was a concerted effort by, you know, like the sons of the Confederate, daughters of the Confederate, you know, of Confederate Confederacy, like these people who like really put, I mean, they were putting federal money in these little towns. So like they snuck those, they snuck those laws into a lot of different things. Like you have to, you know, it was a way, it was pork barreling, basically. We're going to put people to work. We're going to put this local guy to work. We're going to put this, we're going to put together the lost cause. So it was like. You know, that's, that's how we got the preponderance of them. Um, the idea of where it stops is, you know, I don't know. Like, you know, it's, it, it, you know, history is, is not black or white, it's gray, you know? And, and I think they're the people who want history to be black and white, they want, you know, Jefferson to be, you know, all, you know, less, you know absolutely 100% a Renaissance man and, and really interesting and you know smart and sort of cultured but at the same time he was a slave owner you know what i mean it's like it's a it's a complicated thing you know like it's like the different like i always take this to the to reading 12 years a slave versus watching the movie 12 years a slave because in the movie just like talk about complicated character the overseer was a complicated character in the movie in the book the overseer felt it was his responsibility to take care of the slaves that doesn't feed our narrative of what an overseer is supposed to be but in the movie, he was different, right? He was like the, the stereotypical overseer. And so like those kind of things are, you know, really difficult, like it's difficult to understand that they're, like that one slave master that he had in the book was a, you know, a kind, gentle, decent man that probably wouldn't have owned slaves had, they, had he known that there was another way. You know, like that, it's like it's, it's a complicated thing. So, you know, applying our historical understandings to the morality of people from, you know, 200 years ago is is difficult and probably problematic on our part, um, but to say where it stops, I don't know. It's you know, it, it's okay to have the monument as long as we have the conversation. Do you know what I mean? Like as long as there's a conversation. You know, they're doing that in Stone Mountain, Georgia, where they're putting, they're having a conversation. They're literally just like, not only are going to have the, the Stone Mountain, which is a, a, a monument to the Confederacy, but they're putting a monument to Dr. King there, and they're going to have a conversation about it. And I will, you know, just let's note that there's a very revolutionary strain in American life that goes back to the Puritans uh, against the notion of idolatry and smashing idols. Uh, and, um, you know, the American Revolution, they, they, they attacked the houses, they attacked the property of the, of the loyalists. And um, so I, I think that there's a recognition that in that that the the powers that be place great, great credence in the value of these monuments, and they are meant to be tools of oppression, as, as Joel said. I see Marita here, and uh, you know, I went down in Cuba um, a few months ago, and, the, and uh, Fidel has not allowed there to be any statue of Fidel in the country. He would never allow it, and no schools named after him, no streets, and it was like, he knew, you, if, you, if there were statues that go up, they could come down, <laughs> you know, they could come down. And uh, so I, I uh, you know, I'm, I'm a historian too, and I, I you know, I like, I, I like monuments, you know, material culture, and these, there's histories there, but, you know, maybe we cannot progress as a, as a nation uh, until we, 
understand that much of this has to go. It just, it, it, no, no more, no more. It, that some of this has to, has to go or else people cannot walk down their own streets and see a landscape that is not built on a message of oppression. And it's gonna be painful. And I have suggested in my own talk today that maybe it's not just the Confederate monuments, maybe it's the other Civil War monuments too. So I just had a comment on the, um, why the North kind of ceded the narrative uh, to the South. And it's, it makes me think of an inconvenient truth. Because at the time, uh, those in power in the North were running the cotton mills and the factories here in Lawrence and, and up and down the river. They needed that cotton. And if, if they couldn't get the cotton, then the folks up here wouldn't have the nice cotton shirts and the, all the things that, and the jobs. Um, so you really didn't, you didn't look under that rock too much. You just, it worked. It worked. Getting back to the monuments. Um, so it sounds to me like you would not favor correcting the language that accompanies the monuments so that if they are uh, idolizing um, people of oppression, that's explained, and that explains the history of the people who wanted them there, but it also explains the crime of oppression. You would rather tear down all the monuments? I think it's a valid point. I, I personally wouldn't tear down all the monuments. I think that when you forget where things are, you forget why we, why we got here. You know, like, um, you know, just, just this morning we were getting ready to watch Tom and Jerry, and I remember thinking to my mom, you know, my mom's over there. I was thinking to myself, like, we're going to put the 40s Tom and Jerry on, but I wonder if they've, like, censored it, you know, because they censor it a lot of the times. And I think when, when you censor stuff, as opposed to having a conversation about it, you, you basically erase the history of it. And, you know, when you erase the history of it, then you get kids like in my, you know, I had a student in one of my classes who was like, I'm going to come dressed as you, Joel, for Halloween. This is a college student. He's like, I'm going to wear a black face. And I'm like, don't. Like, let me explain this to you. Um, <laughs> Because he had no idea, and the reason that he didn't, he had no idea, is because that history is is race. Like people don't understand what that's like, and like they don't understand how, like what we had to do in order to get that to stop. And so we erase those things and pretend like they never happened, and then people bring that stuff back. And like you know, like you need that. I, you know, I think the monuments should stay. I just think we should have a real clear conversation about those things. You know, I'm not advocating we take hammers from here and go start smashing the Civil War monument out on Islington <laughs> Street. Uh, but, you know, who's going to decide? I mean, I think we have, to, we have to go right back to the start of the conversation and not say just because it's there, it gets to stay. And who's going to decide what gets to be written? And how do we know that, what that message will be? And, and I just think we, we have to get around the, the, the you know, it's, it's us against this or this monument against that or, or so on. And, and, and what I was trying to do in my talk is say we've got to rethink what memory means and who owns it. I just like a, a powerful message that if you could go to Robert E. Lee Elementary School and, you know, some, you know, like, you know, white kid, some town that's all mostly white kids and you actually have to have a conversation about who Robert E. Lee was. Do you know what I mean? Like, like what kind of a powerful conversation you have a balanced conversation about that as opposed to just pretend like it doesn't exist? I grew up in New Jersey and then we spent about eight years in Connecticut before I retired. And we made a decision to go south. We never lived in the south before, so we ended up in South Carolina, Buford, which is on the coast. And when we moved there in 2007, I believe this is correct, the state capitol still had the Confederate flag at the top of the Capitol building, I guess under the state flag or on top of the state flag, I'm not sure which way it was. And it took a few years later before that finally came down. I think it was largely due to business pressures. No, it came down in 2013, like 2013 or 14, yeah. Okay, yeah. Yeah, it was really, really and So that was flying. And we also learned things. There was an undercurrent living there that we just sensed, you know, this, this is not all happy faces in the porches with the people drinking their juleps and stuff. And, and the most visible thing we witness is the Memorial Day parades. One year was white, the next year it was black. Mm -hmm. And I communicated with the mayor of Buford, who's still the mayor today, and I said, what is up? He says, oh, this has been this way for years, John. 
And then, you know, we just have two different groups organizing these parades. I said, yeah, right. But so, I, don't, I, don't, I presume a lot of you never lived in the South. <laughs> well, I don't, that's why we're here. <laughs> <laughs> it's not the weather. <laughs> Just before I pass this on, because um, in Russia, what they do with their um, the problematic narrative monuments is they've created a park and created a counter narrative along with that. And in Germany, they don't allow those Nazi symbols or those um, figures at all. So, you know, where do we fall in that, in mm -hmm. that narrative? Interesting. Mm -hmm. yeah. David mentioned uh, Cuba and the lack of not only monuments but photographs or any acknowledgement to Fidel in Cuba. He, he absolutely didn't want them. Um, you'll see Jose Marti, who is a very well-known Cuban poet all over. He's in the schools, and I didn't even know who he was until I went to Cuba for the first time. But one of the monuments that I saw there, which I found extraordinary and very, very different perspective on, on the world, was a, um, a monument to Julius and Ethel Rosenberg. And according to the plaque, they were being acknowledged, um, and they were um, acknowledged, and that they were assassinated by the US government. Mm -hmm. So you, you, know, you think about history and how people look at history in a very different way. So maybe some of our own monuments could have information added to them with a different perspective on it, not necessarily taking them down, but, but expanding what is on there so that other viewpoints can be expressed. Interesting. Yeah. Oh, there was one here. Okay, I'll do this in order. One, two, three, all right? <laughs> So um, I am responding to a couple of things that have struck me about this conversation, and then you all can respond to my response. So thank you. This has just been illuminating. So I have one comment about the BBC and talking about America and the fact that they still have a monarchy. They still have a royal family, which seems a little bit odd to kind of speculate on what's going on in America. So in terms of <laughs> <laughs> monumental getting stuck, I would say that's pretty stuck. So uh, not that I don't like following the royals in their lives, but a monarchy. Okay, so uh, another, and in line with that, okay, so they ended enslavement much earlier than we did in America. And when I give these tours, I'm amazed at how little I know about our history in the world. And so I get an education when I give the Sankofa tours, and one bit of education I got is that they ended enslavement because they paid the lords and owners of the enslaved persons for their property. They never paid the enslaved persons, they paid the lords, the owners. So to be um, proud of the fact that that ended earlier than it ended here, it kind of look behind the curtain of what that means. And when the triangle trade sort of came to an end in 1809, another learning on the tour. You, every, anyone who hasn't taken this tour, it's given by several different people through the course of the summer, take it because it's fascinating and you might teach us something in the process because I always learn from the people I give these tours to. So this triangle trade comes to an end and the, North, uh, uh, the US and England are policing so that they return ships full of enslaved people back to Africa. But what's happening with enslavement as it continues in the United States, tragically, it becomes a matter of procreation. So while you cannot any longer purchase slaves from, from Africa or the African countries, you can have your enslaved people have children and then they become your property too. So, you know, I, I'm thinking about the monuments of our mind and the way in which we ignore what's going on inside ourselves and make up these myths around 
well, enslavement was maybe better in the North. It wasn't, you know, it just wasn't. And so, I, and I, I share that, and I guess I would ask this question of the monument of the mind for anybody who wants to, I guess that's sort of what we're talking about in a way today too. So those are my comments, and before Jerry Ann takes the mic away from me, um, <laughs> I guess my question would be, um, more on the line of, it, it continues, and I don't know that it's an answerable question, the what do we do part, and I appreciate you so much, Eric, for giving the tours of the cellar holes. That's, um, that lifting that, those individuals who are forgotten is probably the most important thing that we can do. It's a more constructive building block, I think, than anything else we can do. So those are my comments. You know, Eric's story I think is so important because it shows how active the expulsion of black families was in New Hampshire in the 1830s and 40s precisely because they were worried about uh, free communities of color and um, escaped slaves from settling in the state. And then another movement was the, the 1890 to 1910 anti-tramp movement. And you can read about this. Um, there's actually a novel um, you know, written about in New Hampshire and the fear of black tramps, black tramps. And so that was another period in which uh, African Americans were, were driven, driven from the state. Um, Hi. Um, so I grew up in the South, so I'm going to just comment a little bit and then I have a, an observation. I'd like to know what you think about it. Um, so I grew up in Florida in the 70s um, in an integrated school. And um, there were beaches that we knew you don't go to because that was the black beach. You know, you just didn't go. Um, but also, it was a matter of pride for some of my friends when they got their first cars, they put their Confederate license plate on the front. You don't have to have two plates in Florida. Um, so the experience growing up for me um, is probably very different than the experience of someone growing up in Connecticut or something. And it's part of the culture. Um, I didn't know about the lost cause till I was older and moved um, out of the state. Um, but it, I think that we don't realize the same way that we feel things. People have been brought up feeling something or understanding something and it's part of their culture. And that's such a difficult thing to change. I think maybe that's why um, you have to almost chip at things away, like with, with drops of water and erode it, because it's so ingrained from when you're very young. Um, and until you get knowledge, and you know, I'm happy that I moved out of Florida, um, until you get knowledge and you get experience of, of different people, you don't have any other perspective than what's in your community. Um, so I think just, it's just a comment. But also, um, so I went to Fort McAllister, which I don't know if anybody knows, it's one of the only earthen forts from the Civil War, and it's in Georgia, so I'm a big Civil War history buff. Um, and when I was there, um, there was a gentleman who was obviously um, with some sort of group of um, maybe Confederate historians or Confederate something. Um, he saw we had Vermont plates, and he came up and he had a CD and literature, and he's like, have you thought about the war? You know, have you learned? You haven't learned, and he, you know, very much um, putting out um, I guess, lost cause propaganda. This is just a couple years ago. This is me going, you know, on a <laughs> historical, to a historical site. So it's just so um, pervasive. And, um, you know, I want your thoughts of things like Civil War sites and, and forts and, and um, it's a different kind of monument um, that you don't want to take away, but how, you know, I'm looking at that fort in a completely different way than this gentleman. And I just want to know your thoughts on, on things like um, battlefields and historical sites um, and those, you know, how do we interpret that and how, do, how can we use those as learning tools? Yeah, that's, that's hard. Um, you know, because I think because the, the lost cause, you know, narrative is so entrenched in what we... I mean, it's, you know, it's entrenched in history books. It's in, you know, people don't want to talk about it. And it's like, just because we have a conversation about it, it doesn't mean that I'm saying that white people are bad. You know what I mean? Like, it's not, like, that's the thing that I think people think, that if we, if we bring this stuff up, then we're making an argument that there's one group that's better than the other. And it's not that. It's like, let's just have a real clear conversation about it. You know, were there some, were there some people living in the South 
who were anti-slavery. Yeah, but the power structure wasn't. You know, like, you know, were there um, were there black people who fought in the Confederate in the in the Confederate Army? Yeah, you know, that's that's the truth. You know, we can't we have to confront these things with facts and an understanding. But I think it's really important, specifically with the Civil War, is to only use primary documents because so much has been written about the Civil War after the fact that we've got, it's all, it's all eroded, you know? People will, you know, like somebody will send me a blog, like this blog says, I'm like, I don't really care what this blog says because Mississippi said this in 18, you know, 60. This is what they said, you know? This is what South Carolina said. This is what, um, this is what Lincoln said at this time. This isn't a, you know, my interpretation of what this guy said. It's an actually what they said. And like, you know, keeping that in mind and it's, it, you know, it's subtle, right? It's, it's subtle, but it's also like, you have to be kind. It's like, you know, it's, it's a lot of ways. It's like telling your kids Santa Claus doesn't exist. Do you know what I mean? You don't just like rip the bandaid off and go, you know what? Surprise. <laughs> Magic ain't a thing. You know what I mean? It's like a slow sort of like, well, this is the way it might be until they get to a place where they can handle it. I think we have to do that with the people who are really, you know, entrenched with the lost cause. You have to go, yeah, you know, it's, you know, look at the Confederate flag and then there, there, later I'll tell you about what Mississippi said. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, that's, you know, that's the way you have to, I, I, I just, it's got to be gentle. Like, because I mean, you know, going and pulling down the monument on our own is sort of abrupt and it's sort of it's it's making people confront stuff that they're uncomfortable about and i think we have to be more gentle than that i mean because ultimately we want to live in a society where everybody's part of it you know ultimately we want to like and this 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 was controversial but ultimately we want to enfold the white supremacists into everywhere else we want them to have changed right we want them to have like come back to the fold and goes you know what that was wrong for me to think that so we can't, like, we have, and how do you get to them? You have to do it piece by piece. You have to do it, you know, bit by bit. And it's like, it's, it's like sharing stories. It's, you know, making that connection, being empathetic and understanding where they're coming from. And then getting to that, you know, like, bit by bit. It's, it's you know, it's slow and steady, but, it's, you know, we got to do it. It's got to be gentle. I, if I can just jump in for a second, too. Um, I have to give another, get another plug for Black Heritage Trail of New Hampshire for, for helping us uh, think about monuments in a different way, too, by, by having this trail throughout New Hampshire and Kittery, too, right? Um, these are places that are out of the way. You know, New Hampshire is a very rural state, and uh, I think people identify with, with what's local very strongly. And when, when folks in, for instance, Newport, New Hampshire, see that there was a, a place called Coit's Mountain, where there was a very small black community there, and they hear the story about this Coit's Mountain and the people who lived there. I think that will be very compelling. And um, you know, other sites along the trail, like uh, Canaan, New Hampshire, Noise Academy, you know, which was taken off its foundation by a hundred oxen uh, because it had students uh, of both black and white. And, and in Milford, you know, with, with the Harriet Wilson House. I think, uh, you know, this will really help spread um, a legacy that will help inform and, and educate people that, that not all is black and white, that, that history is, is shades of color and open to interpretation. And, uh, and we need to think about the context then and, and as it is today. Bob Chase, a couple of quick comments um, from the late 40s, early 50s. Uh, I grew up in Durham, which was a totally white town in the late 40s, to my knowledge anyway, um, except I was on the cutting room floor of Louis de Rochemont's uh, movie. So, uh, <laughs> but that was essentially white people playing black people. <laughs> okay, yeah, all right. Uh, secondly, uh, my father was at UNH. Uh, Korean War, the family picked up and moved to Albany, Georgia. We moved into the better part of town. It was a simple little Cape Cod house. It was the better part of town. Um, I was approximately in sixth grade. Uh, the first week there, there was an assembly. We had Miss Davis, the principal, and she walked around with this, looked like a college paddle. 
And uh, when you were bad, she, her comment was, business is going to pick up, and you wanted to stay away from that. Ever. <laughs> but she came out on the stage, and uh, she said, we're going to sing the national anthem. And then another teacher marched out with the Confederate flag, and they started to sing Dixie. <laughs> wow. Dumb little Bob sat down. <laughs> uh, the principal walked over, and she says, you are going to join us. Now, I wasn't that liberal, and I was a scared little kid, but I didn't, I didn't get up. Wow. My parents were mm -hmm. hauled in that day. There was a meeting, and they said, we can't protect your child in the school. We moved to the other side of Albany, Georgia, which was a sizable city mm. in a less affluent area, right on the edge of the peanut fields and such, and got along very well in that school. But uh, that was you know, certainly a major experience. And it was fear that first day that I was in that school. Mm. Wow. There were a bunch of... <laughs> boys my age, and they were out to get me after school for not getting into their system. Um, well. <laughs> Hi there. In 2015 and 2016, we all saw Black Lives Matter. They were in the news every day, they were doing, you know, there were riots, they were shutting down highways, I mean, they were making their voices heard. And then Trump got elected, and I thought, oh boy, here we go, because he does not stand for, for what Black Lives <coughs> Matter stands for. Or anything. Or anything. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, but what happened is that Black Lives <laughs> Matter sort of fell off the map. It, they, they, they disappeared. And I know that, that police haven't stopped, well, what was that? So I know that the police haven't stopped killing black men and young black men, but we don't see these sort of reactions anymore. And then last mm. week with the indictments that came out of Washington, it's now shown that Russia was uh, co-opting the Black Lives Matter message. And so I'm, I, I'm wondering, I mean, the, the message was so powerful and it was making such a statement. And then it, it has the memory of Black Lives Matter been been whitened by Russia? Has it been degraded by Russia? Um, can it be trusted because Russia was involved in it? I don't know. I'm not. I'm not even sure how to answer that. <laughs> what to say to that? Um, I, I don't know. Like the. Um, I don't trust anything I see on the internet. I mean at all. So um, unless it's come from like specifically somebody that I know, I don't, I don't trust anything. I, I find it all suspect. Is that true in the regular press? It's true everywhere. Like I find it all suspect. I mean, you know, a couple years ago, this little kid named Dexter Youngblood, that was actually his name, sent me a mess, sent me a, a letter. And he said, you know, he goes, Joel Christian Gill, I got a couple of questions for you. I've been looking for these people that you wrote about in your book for the past six months, and I can't find any of them. So I want to know two things. One, did you do this just for money? And two, did you make all these people up? So the first thing I was like, well, I mean, they're you know, it's uncelebrated narratives from black history, so I draw about black, uh, obscure black history, so that makes sense that you couldn't find them because it took me a long time to find them too. And so I started to think about it and write a letter to this little kid in that respect and I was like you know what no he shouldn't trust what I just said he like this is a good thing continue to ask questions because that's the only way we get to a place where we're actually like where we I mean we don't ask questions we in America want it food, spoon fed to us we don't want entertainment that is open ended we don't want movies that don't make sense we don't we want we don't like soccer because sometimes there's not a conclusion you know what I mean? Like, that is the thing. We need, like, this is like an American societal thing, and we need to have some ambiguity in our lives. And it's like, you know, things need to be a little bit more complicated. It can't always be this or that. And I think, um, you know, Black Lives Matter and the Russia, you know, the infiltration of social media is just indicative of the idea that Russians understand that America's need one thing or the other. They don't, they don't, 
they know how to manipulate us because we want to be spoon fed. We don't question things. We want, you know, we want our own truths. Now to your uh, question about did the Black Lives Matter go um, without being noticed? Black Lives Matter went indoors to parents to child. As you notice how my son speaks, I have taught him, and as each black mother has taught each one of her children that your life matters, be careful who you talk to, be careful how you talk to them, and if, if you're angry, you keep it within yourself and you bring it home. Black lives matter, but black lives matter because black mothers and fathers have talked to their children. It, the, the black lives matter, um, the explosion has not gone away. Amen. What it has gone is indoors and in churches and in places where the black children are. So it's not gone away. Yes. My name is Fred Ross, and I know a lot of you in here. Uh, I spent uh, 35 years all together in uniform and got out as a major. And some of the fellas in this room probably were drafted at one point or another and been in one branch of the armed forces. When the reality of the Vietnam War hit me, I was guarding an airplane. And uh, I was told by the commander, uh, Sergeant Ross, would you watch the bird while we go in and file a new flight plan? I said, sure. This was the Takli, Thailand, up in northern Thailand. I heard the rotors of uh, helicopters, bloom, 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 bloom. They landed off of the right wing tip. It was very hot. I walked over there. They were full of bodies. Young men, a lot of them clearly Mexican from Mexico, and other minorities. And we have a president who want to build a wall. And all the person who's not really an immigrant of some sort are the indigenous people. And they came over on the land bridge. Is that not correct? Well, again, my family and I, we lived all over, <laughs> seen a lot of tragedy, a lot of miracles. In Montana, South Dakota, California, South Carolina, Texas, Japan, we've been all over. Decided New Hampshire had a lot to offer. And the only color that I saw that they really appreciate is the color green. <laughs> <laughs> We've had several businesses that were relatively successful. But there's some good people here. You can't learn too much about the differences. I'm from Somerville, South Carolina. 17 miles south of Charles. That's the place these people were murdered in Bible study. I found out recently that the pastor of that church was a distant relative. When they integrated in Somerville, there was very little problems. Why is that? Because they've been diddling each other for 200 years. They were all relatives, the majority of them. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. It's very powerful. I was just thinking of actions that we are already taking and that we can take. I was just thinking of four examples. Um, I just watched Hidden Figures. As good as documentary films are, we know it's movies that are seen by far more people. But just using that film alone as a frame of reference in conversations with people, 
to help unlearn our sanitized history. That's one thing. Another one that's quite different is Daryl Davis, the great black uh, jazz pianist who has gotten Klansmen to quit because he was so humanized in his performance. They're sitting in the audience, and he began talking and listening to them, and he transformed them. It's an extraordinary story, book and, and film related to that. When you go to all these dozens of plantations, these former plantations that are extolling the virtues of the slave owners and the fine workings of the plantation, ask them, why aren't you extolling the virtues of the enslaved people as they do at the only museum of slavery in the country, the Whitney Museum in Louisiana? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, before I have a comment, I wanted to relay that I, I recall as a kid when my mom got gas at the Esso station, they gave her green stamps for uh, dishes. And I thought that was uh, related to the postal worker and the green book. But anyway, um, <laughs> to me, um, true monuments that would be ageless would not just be physical in nature. It would be in the stories we write, the books we read, the art and dance, the works of man, the culture that we develop. How else would we, from my Jewish race, recall a slavery that happened and was redeemed 3,400 years ago if it wasn't for a Passover Seder that was also the Last Supper of Jesus? So I just want you to comment on what a true monument would be, which maybe is not necessarily physical, could be the Heritage Trail or whatever New Hampshire establishes. Thank you. But isn't that what we're, what we're fighting over right now? What is the American story and who gets to tell it? I mean, I think you're, you're absolutely right, but um, we're in a country because of racism that has silenced for hundreds of years. And, and I think the, the Civil War story is particularly egregious because that was, a, that was a war of black liberation. It was not a war between disagreeable white cousins. And that's, that's what's been lost. That's what's been lost. And the black veterans of that war knew it. Um, Frederick Douglass made his almost last public address before he died in New Hampshire at the dedication of the Hale Monument in front of the State House. And the first thing he said was, I'm surprised you remembered me. And so he, he knew even, even then, just 30 years after the war had ended, what had, what had happened with that story. I, um, he's doing a great job. Um, I, I was asked on a, um, I did a documentary for um, Boston Comic Con, and they asked me what I'd like. We were talking about science fiction, and they asked me what I'd like to see in science fiction. And um, I think what I said surprised them. I'm like, I'd like to see science fiction where people's race is ambiguous. Yeah. And um, they were like, I don't understand. Like, they, it was like, what? Well, it was like, what do you mean? I'm like, well, when you watch something that you watch Star Trek Discovery, like the newest science fiction on right now, there's still black people and white people, which means we have not evolved in 400 years to actually define that race is still a defined thing. Like the, the, the amount of pigment in our skin is still a defined thing. So when you watch that and you see it, you're just like, really? 400 <laughs> years, we still like in space where there's like bug people, we still think that there's a difference between a black person and a white person. And so, you know, that's the monument that I'd like to see is that, you know, once we get past that, past, once we get past that place where we are now equal, um, you know, it's like, when, when will we get to a place where it just doesn't, like, it, that, that's, we have to get to a place, we have to get past the equality part first, right? We're not equal yet. And once we get to equal, then we can get to what doesn't matter. Do you know what I mean? Like, one of the things that I had someone say to me once is, like, I don't care 
it was a it was a it was a colleague at where I teach, and it was like I don't care if a student is black, white, purple, or other. I just want them to make you know great art. And it's just like no, 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 no. You have to care. Like I care what you are, and I'm going to make you know my personal responsibility as a human being in this society to make sure that everybody else cares too. And then once we get to that place where we're equal. Then we can start saying it doesn't matter what you, then we can start saying I don't see color. Do you know what I mean? Because until we get to that place where we're equal, we're always gonna see it. It's like a ridiculous thing anyway. I don't see color, well how do you deal with traffic lights? <laughs> <laughs> do you know what I mean? Like you gotta get to a place where we get, to, we, have to, we, have to have, we have to have true equality um, and equity before we can start ignoring everything else. And, then, and some people think that we were already there, right? Like, I don't see color anymore. You know, I don't think that. I don't see color. I think, um, you know, I don't think about people being black, white, or other. And I'm like, well, then you're ignoring a whole lot of stuff because there's some stuff that's still affecting black people specifically, and you're ignoring those things. So, you know, once we get to that place, then we can get to a place where it's just like it doesn't matter. But until then, you know, until then, Star Trek is just basically, you know, you know, when I just I hate the diversity thing. Like, let's just get everybody around the table, and you got, you know, you bring your women's intuition, and you bring your black ability to dance, and we're gonna all get around the table, and we're gonna create this, bit, you know, this thing. And it's just like, no, it's not about that. It's about understanding that at some point we shouldn't all look like this. We shouldn't all be tribal, you know, tribal, tribalistic in that sense, because, you know, because it still matters. And until we get past that, it, it's still going to matter. So until we get to a place where that no longer matters, we're still going to be in this place. Thank you. Every Thank you. It's been very powerful. You've been waiting a long time, too. Yes. For your well, <laughs> if you knew Thank me, you I, I could wade in on yeah. everything that you said. But one thing is, and I'm a psychotherapist, so that just know that when I say this, that you, you're very powerful, and each one of you in your own way, you've made us all think about, and you've been saying in many ways that we need to have the interaction and the conversations. And so I said, and I come from the South, and I have lived in many parts of the South as well as up here. So what I'm really asking is, what can we do? I want to be a part of bringing this together. I grew up with all of this. It was just a natural part. And my dad was a minister, so we had a lot of people in our home that I just want to know how do we get back to that where we're really doing that. And I wondered about, Eric, with you, has what you learned, has that been, a, have you been able to talk about that openly with the people in your community and that sort of thing? So I'm at the stage of life when I want to be part of this and I need to hear something that teaches us how do we connect in this way? How do we become open and caring for one another? How do we learn then when to shut up and when to just, you know, maybe say what we really need to say? Is that enough? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I, I, personally, I think it takes all kinds of approaches. You know, some people relate to the, uh, to the story whether it's history or whether it's current. Some people relate to, to place, you know, um, especially to local. Um, some people want to be brought to a place to explore the story of America and, uh, and, and all of its messy past and, and its messy present. Um, but, you know, I guess bringing it local uh, for me, it was, um, it was learning that People in, in my little town were still very uncomfortable with talking about um, a, a period in their little town that was very unsettling. Uh, the narrative in, in our town, like so many other towns, is, well, 
we've always been wel welcoming. <laughs> we've always been a place where we help each other and, and we learn from each other and, and we support folks. And, uh, you know, when you look at just the, the stories that I was uh, learning about in my town, that, that just wasn't the case. It, it wasn't always supportive. It was, it was messy. And um, people who had uh, just different color skin and stood out were, uh, were pushed aside. They were on, on the outside. And, and sometimes when I would want to discuss the story with some you know, folks in town, I would get the, I would get the reaction that, well, well, it wasn't really racism. It, it was, how do you know it was racism? Because we support each other in, in our little town. And, and they weren't really black because they were mixed race. And I think, you know, that's just crazy because, the, you know, it, what is there, a box for this is racism and everything outside that box is not racism, you know? Um, and it has to be in that box to be racism. Well, what if, how do you define it? Like I, see, like I said, things are messy and, 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 and this box for people who are black and there's a box for people who are, are white, that's, that's nuts too. These, it's just people, right? And, and, and they have a, a, a strong um, legacy of, of different family people, whether it involved violence or slavery, we don't know. In, in my story, sometimes we do know, like in, in, in Jefferson's case, we do know that story, and, and it's unsettling. And um, I think, I think you, you hit it on the head. It just takes all kinds of ways to connect with, with different people. And we just can't let some things be completely forgotten. And, you know, thank you for asking the question. And, but, you know, you're in the front row, but just turn around and look, look at this room. This, is Port this didn't just happen. This is Portsmouth as a community decided that this history mattered. And, and extraordinary people, you know, Jerry Ann, Valerie, we've got Bob Thompson here. Where's Bob? Who's the head of our, our Black Heritage Show in New Hampshire. And, and I look around and see all these community members who have given so much of their of their time and their hearts and their souls. And so we don't have to look somewhere else to start and to do something. It's just, it's right here. Yeah. James Baldwin said that racism didn't stand up to contact. Um, and um, I believe that, you know, what I try to do with the work that I do with my books and when I talk about this is it's, it's all about sharing stories. Um, because sharing stories humanizes people. Um, and, you know, my work is about sharing the stories of, um, you know, obscure black history stories, but I think it's just about sharing personal stories. You know, it's about, you know, it's, a, it's, you know, it's about telling somebody like, you know, that thing that you just said, here's a personal, here's a personal story that I know that's, that changes that, like, you know, is that, the, is that the way you think about it? It's sort of making that connection, and I think that's the important thing, and I also think, um, it's important not to call people racist. I don't like, and the reason that I say that, um, and it sounds it sounds counterintuitive, but because people have gotten to a place where they think racism is a specific type of thing. Um, racism is, you know, it's it's you know guys in pointy hats burning crosses. But you know, just just as an example, you know, we live in New Boston. When I leave that town, I significantly decrease the black population, probably by a couple of percentage points. Um, <laughs> And we, my mom wants to go to the church all the time, so we go down to the church, and everybody's like, oh, we're so happy you're here. We're so glad to see you. And it's just like, oh, you know, I know I'm the only black person in the room, but that's okay. Um, <laughs> but um, a lady goes, came up to my mom, and she comes beside her, and she goes, I wish I could have sat beside you so I could hear you sing. <laughs> and, like, that's diet racism, right? That's like, you know, it's, 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 a, it's a bias that, you know, it's like people don't understand, and so it's like, you, and it's like she, she, and if I told that lady that that's a racist thing, she's like, I'm not racist, like, you know, like I'm, you know, I would have voted for Obama three times, you know what I mean? Like, um, and it's like, it's, you know, it's a little more subtle than that. It's about, you know, like understanding where we're coming from, 
You know what I mean? Understanding. And this really powerful thing happened to me, you know, probably seven or eight years ago. I was on the street with this woman who worked at our school, um, and she's really attractive. We were walking back and forth between two buildings, and she almost stopped traffic. Like, people were, like, blowing and honking the horns and, like, yelling stuff. And I'm like, you've got some admirers. And she's just like, yeah, whatever, and, like, completely blew it off. And so as opposed to just, like, that, this, that being a passing thing that I don't think about, I actually thought about that for a second. And I'm like, what must it be like to not just be able to walk down the street and have that happen to you on a regular basis? You know, what must it be like to not be able to smile at a man who's walking down the street just to smile to say hello without that being some invitation for harassment? Do you know what I mean? Like in that moment, I got a little bit of her story and I understood and I like understood that. You know what I mean? And I think that people don't, people don't think about it. People don't think that. People don't think what it's like to be somebody else. Like imagine what it's like when you can't, you know, when you, when you walk into an elevator and you're as big as I am, and you're surrounded by white people, and you think, I need to make myself look less intimidating. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. like imagine what that's like for, for anybody. Like, what the differences are, what they bring, what, they ha what, they, what that means for us. And just, like, sharing that story. And I think it's important to share stories like that. I usually come up with this topic each time I come to one of these gatherings. But having visited schools so often throughout New Hampshire, very much so, and other parts of New England, our children are being set up, each young generation, to be racist because their first introduction in the classroom to the fact that there are even black people in American history comes in, uh, in February. They start off with Thanksgiving and white people. This is in the very young grades. Yeah. And so they're understanding the, the message really in the classroom. The white child looks at the black child, says, you're not part of our history till February. And then when it's introduced, it's all South. We're still hanging into that 19th century historian's bias story in our elementary schools. It's all about the South and abolition. Thank God the teachers are enlightened enough. They do get into civil rights and, and Martin Luther King. But I maintain that at the very beginning for our children, and New Hampshire has a very outstanding teacher's book that should be off the shelves, that teaches the teacher that black people are nothing in the story until much later. I'll tell a quick story. My, my son is African-American in, in fifth grade class, not far from here. Um, they're going to teach slavery. And so the uh, teacher had them divide up into masters and slaves. And, and, and so all, the, all my, my son's little friends want to say, but I want you to know, Harper, I never would have whipped you. <laughs> so it was OK, you know, it was OK. <laughs> I created a hashtag um, about three or four years ago when my first book came out called 28 Days Are Not Enough um, <laughs> about black history. Um, you know, it's that, you know, I, I keep going, I, you know, I said this earlier, like it's, it's absurd that I'm not American. You know, black people are the true e pluribus unum. And I say that because we didn't come from all the same place. We came from different cultures and different tribes and, um, Jerry Ann grew up eating different things than I did, you know, for, because of where, she fr where she's from. And when she gets here, guess what? You're black now. You know what I mean? Like you're now all part of the same group. Um, and so we really, Im you know, epitomize e pluribus unum more than anything else. Think about like all of the thing, all of American mythos, every part of American mythos. You know, pull yourself up by your bootstraps. You know, black people did that. You know what I mean? Rags to, to riches. Black people did that. You know, e pluribus unum. Black people did that. You go to Washington, D.C., any building older than 300 years is black people built. You know what I mean? And, like, not, not to incorporate that history as an integral part of American history is just absurd. Um, it's absolutely absurd. Because if you remove black people from the equation, this is a completely different country. And I'm not saying it's better. Music won't be good. Food probably wouldn't be good. 
I'm just saying, like, I mean, music and food would not, I mean, when you think about, when we think about American culture, we typically have a tendency to go to Southern culture. And when we think about Southern culture, who built that? You know, who cooked all that food? Who cooked those apple pies? You know what I mean? That was, that was black people. And I think that people have, like, you know, that idea that, you know, my family's been here since Jamestown, and your family came in on Ellis Island, and you lost your accent, and now you eat hamburgers, and you're more American than I am is ridiculous. You know what I mean? It's just, it's an absolutely ridiculous thing. And I think it's, you know, and it's, it's and I, this is, you know, education is really important, but I think it's also about sharing the stories. And, and you know, we, we have this powerful thing in social media now, and, like, you know, calling BS when we see it, like, Looking at the the narrative, like, like when I when they asked me about the science fiction, and I'm like, why can't I see science fiction that doesn't look like that anymore? And people were like, oh, I didn't think about that. I mean, even like Hunger Games, which is science fiction, right? Like when the when they found that the little girl was black in the Hunger Games, when you know that she was originally she was supposed to yeah. be white in the yeah. book. In yeah. reality, she wasn't. Everybody was brown in the book, yeah. and she made a point of saying that everybody was brown. But when we got it on the screen, everybody was diverse. <laughs> Thank you for saying that. Because um, I'm not going to be able to say this clearly, turn your cameras off. <laughs> <laughs> but obviously, this is very complex. And I think we all agree in the room how complex this is, how insidious it is, how subtle the messages are. Um, I love that you just said your last sentence with diverse. And I'd like to rerun uh, re what you were saying about, um, you know, when, uh, the color thing that we, we, we have to factor in color and, and until we're equal, and then it, then it, we can forget about color. And and then you were talking about Star Trek, and there are there's bug people and there's different colored people and different shapes of people, and and I thought we were I I'm trying to train myself to embrace diversity and 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 then move on. You know, we, there are so many diverse species, not only humans, but animals. And um, don't get me started on, on that, right, Sue? Um, I guess my point is, because we do use language when we, when we tell stories, how do we do that? Because um, we, could, we're, we just laughed about the joke about music and food. It would be different in this country without black people. And we all laughed at that, and, and we, we all get it but yet we have to leave this room and deal with other people too. So how do we use, I, I, I'll hear people say, oh, I read this, po or I was reading a poster with a person at the library about guitar lessons and they were, they were black and we were reading this. You always hear someone interject, I was talking to this black person. I don't hear inter people interject, I was talking to a white person. <laughs> about a, a drawing program at the library or something. And, I, and my, we cringe. And my mother-in-law once said that she used the neighbor's pool, Mrs. Love's pool. And, and she was so kind to let me use her pool. And she's black, but she was so kind. And is it OK to describe people that are diverse with the adjective? It depends on, in my opinion, it depends on what you're, like, why you're describing them. If you're trying to pick them out in a crowd, you got to say the black person. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? If it's like, if you're talking about somebody who bought stuff from you the other day, why does that, like, you know what I mean? Like, why do I need to say, well, this white guy came into the store the other day? Like, unless that, like, unless that has some bearing on the conversation, like, I think that's, that's the important thing. But I think it's, you know, this is, this is about... This is when I go back to the, the very first question about the Black Panther and media representation. Like we need um, there to be more than a definitive like stereotype of what black people are, you know, like if positive or negative, like it needs to be more nuanced than that because black people are more nuanced than that. Like we have Trump supporters in our family. You know what I mean? Like there's like, you know, there's, there's, you know, it's, it's a lot more complicated than just, you know, this thing or that thing. And so, and looking at black people as a, as a monolith of a stereotype is really, is really bad, what, no matter which way you do it. But, um, but it's about representation. It's really about representation. We are fighting a negative, you know, representation to, and the media representation, it's kind of like parents teaching children. Right? We teach our kids that you know this red thing over here that 
you know, this is an apple. This is the way an apple is. And so eventually a kid understands this is an apple. And so for the last, you know, 200 years or so, you know, media representation has been this is a black person. This is what they mean. You know what I mean? And it's going to take a lot of positive reinforcement to actually change that understanding. And, and this, is, this is true of everybody. There are studies that have been shown that, you know, everybody in America, you live in American society, you have a negative opinion of black people, like you do. Like, no matter what, this is black people have a negative opinion of black people. Black people have t taken these, in, um, these, um, these um, unconscious bias tests and failed them as well. You know when we don't fail them? When we watch previously some uplifting thing about black people. So when we get information about black people that says that we're not like the others or we're not the, the, the norm or not the stereotype, it changes our perception. And I think that we need to do more of that, right? More positive, more positive reinforcement of black people. I need, we need more movies with Will Smith in them <laughs> as the lead. Do you know what I mean? Like we need that. You know, in movies with Will, Will Smith in the lead where it's not about whether Will Smith is a black man or not, he's just a lead. You know, like the equalizer with, with um, Denzel Washington, it doesn't really matter oh that God. he's black. He's Joel? just, you know what I mean? So, I'm sorry. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, we're almost out of time, so this is the last question for the day. So, uh, it's more of a comment than a question. Just to thank the Black History Trail for putting together all of these events. Um, and I can't, I personally always, uh, feel inspired when I'm at events like this as a New Englander, a black New Englander that can trace my family back to the Revolutionary War as free black people. I feel like it's really, really important that we uncover those stories in New England. And the more we tell them, the more um, this is not the right word, but sort of normalized we are in the conversation so that it's not strange, it's not weird. I'm not weird, I'm not, my family is not unusual. And we're not the only family like this. And um, Joel, when I get the where are you from, I'm really from here. Um, so, <laughs> so and, and I think the more manifestations of that history in the physical being, like me, being here today, are really, really important. Um, so I can't, I, I mean, thank you. And thank you for emphasizing the need to tell stories. I want to come see the cellar holes. Um, and there's a place in Walpole I want to tell you about as well. Um, so I think as the history trail comes along, more and more we'll get to a place where it's not just this anomaly, it's not sort of a special thing, and the whitewashing of the past will start to go away. And I do think it's drops, of, drip drops of water over time. So thank you so much. Good afternoon. So I'm Bob Thompson. I'm the honor to be the president of the board of the Black Heritage Trail of New Hampshire. Thanks to our panelists, including two board members. Uh, but, um, and thanks for all the shout outs about the trail. I appreciate that. Thanks to all of you for coming. Uh, these uh, trails, these tea talks are organized by Jerry Ann Bogus and along with her great group of volunteers that do so much to support the trail and the efforts. So I think you <laughs> And uh, the comment about what's taught in schools, uh, in Portsmouth, uh, you have a trail. And so it doesn't have to begin in February. The trail is very nicely walked uh, in the fall, in spring, any time of the year. And so there's an opportunity to really do history different in this community because of the citizens of Portsmouth. It really is pretty amazing if you think about what is in this town, given the demographics. Uh, that there would be a uh, burying ground uh, honoring slave ancestors who were discovered, uh, that there would be a trail, and now a national trail, in this uh, second or third whitest state in the nation. Yeah. Uh, a reality borne by some of us more f dearly than others. <laughs> and I speak to you as a black man who sings and dances and tells jokes. <laughs> <laughs> but I want to thank you, and next week, uh, come back the same time, same place. Uh, another great tea talk. You want to tell us what the title is next week? Next week? You want to remind me? Anyone got the? Ain't I a woman? Ain't I a woman? Well, ain't I not? Well, ain't I a woman? Uh, so please come uh, and uh, and continue to uh, build uh, authentic connections. And I want to send you off with a song. Oh freedom! Oh freedom! Oh freedom over me! And before I'll be a 
slave, I'll be buried in my grave and go home to my Lord and be free and go home to my Lord and be free. Thanks for yeah.